Hey everybody, I'm Yasmin, and for Hallie, and tonight we are looking at a once-in-a-generation now deadly storm that's bringing holiday travel to its knees as it moves through the Great Lakes in the Northeast two days before Christmas. Right now, you're taking a look at Cleveland, Ohio, where things are looking pretty gloomy. The tops of buildings are covered in snow, and there is Chicago. You still can see a few people walking around in that brutal cold as well. Some 140 million people across 37 states are going to be impacted by the storm. Tens of millions of Americans are facing bone-chilling temperatures, blizzard conditions that could be life-threatening, especially for people who don't have power. And that is a major, major chunk of, chunk of people. As of this hour, there are more than one million power outages. At least nine people have been killed in weather-related incidents. According to reports from state officials, on the roads, this is what forecasters mean when they say, by the way, zero visibility. This is in a parking lot in Buffalo, New York. You cannot see a thing. And then at the airports, you've got almost double the cancellations today compared to yesterday. Take a look at all of these people uh, sleeping overnight at Denver's airport because their flights got pushed. A situation that looks familiar for a lot of people right now. My friend got canceled last night. He had to drive all the way to Toronto last night. So, so not to miss Christmas. I tried to call like a couple of times over the last couple of days to see if we could do a change to yesterday and they wouldn't let me. We're going to be here all day and we'll get in tomorrow morning. All right, we've got our team ready to cover all the angles of the Storm Shack Brewsters on the ground for us in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Julia Jester's at Reagan National Airport in Arlington, Virginia. Bill Karens is here with the latest forecast. Want to start, though, uh, with Shaq. You've been out there all day, Shaq. It has been rough for you. You got really oh, frigid yeah. temperatures. The snow continues to come down. Take us there. Yeah, the snow continues to come down, but more dangerously is that the snow is getting whipped around because of these high winds. You have officials all through the area asking people to stay off the highway. We've seen nine car pileups uh, about f uh, 10 miles north of where we are right now. In other areas, you're continuing to hear about the whiteout conditions. And what you do, the reason why they're talking about that is because of the wind. It, yes, this area is used to snow. We are going to continue to see snow. They're expecting up to two feet of snow in this area. To, uh, through Christmas Day, but uh, the wind, when you have those gusts go hitting about 60 miles an hour, uh, that's what leads to so much danger, and that's what leads to the lack of visibility, the loss of visibility as people are on those roads. Hey, Shaq, tell me about power loss, um, right? Because a lot of folks are without power right now. That is the fear amidst these frigid temperatures. You can't heat your house. That is a problem when it comes yeah. to protecting yourselves and your family and safety, really. What resources do folks have? Right, and these winds, I mean, that's another potential threat of the winds is that they can knock down power lines, knock down uh, tree branches, which then get on power lines and uh, takes out power for folks at the worst time when we're dealing with these frigid temperatures. One tip that you're hearing from officials is that if you're able to watch us right now, make sure your phones are charged. Make sure those batteries are full uh, so that if you did lose power, you're able to uh, uh, still communicate uh, with the time being. If you have lost power, if you unfortunately do lose power they tell you to make sure you're wearing layers inside make sure you're going and try to stay in one room keep a towel under the door that way the heat stays within that room because as you mentioned power Please. is a real concern here nearly 30,000 people have lost power in the state of Michigan many more people across the country have lost power so that is something we'll still be watching and it's still a threat if we're having these high winds continue through the night Shaq, it's going to be dark there pretty soon, which means temperatures are going to drop even lower. How cold right about now would you guess it is? Yeah, right now, the last time we checked, it's actually increased a little bit. We're at about six degrees uh, Fahrenheit, but okay. when you factor in the wind chill, that puts it at about 20 degrees below zero. So we're, I guess I should be grateful Man. for that, but we haven't, uh, we're still dealing with some pretty frigid conditions right now. You're a rock star, Shaq. Uh, we appreciate you so much. Get inside. Uh, drink some hot chocolate if you can. All right. Hope you get a good night's sleep tonight, my friend. Got it. Um, thank you. You heard him. He said it's cold. Uh, wanna... <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thanks, Shaq. All right. Want to bring in now Julia Jester, um, who is posted up at Reagan National Airport. So we were talking about yesterday, Julia. Um, there were tons of, of airline uh, cancellations throughout the day. 
Today is looking even worse. Some folks having to post up overnight, um, sleep at the airport because their flights got delayed and or canceled, moved to other days. Talk to us. What are you seeing today? Yeah, Yasmin, we've been here for a couple of days now, and it did get a bit worse before it's hopefully looking better. There have been 7,300 plus delays at airports across the country, and 4,800 flights have been canceled today. 800 of those in Chicago's main two airports. So if you're trying to get out of Seattle, Chicago, New York, Detroit, Denver, Portland, that's going to be a lot trickier. Fortunately, here in D.C., it does look Look like most folks will make it home in time for Christmas. Yasmin? How are folks feeling? Um, because, you know, amidst these delays ahead of the holidays, folks just want to get to where they are going. Obviously, it can be really frustrating if you're waiting at the airport for hours on end. Airports, airlines aren't necessarily the most forthcoming uh, when it comes to when your plane's actually going to get up and off the ground. So what are you hearing from folks there? Folks here have actually been pretty optimistic. Nearly everyone we talked to was religiously checking their phone ahead of leaving for the airport to make sure that they weren't missing a notification about a delayed or a canceled flight. We spoke to one woman whose flight yesterday was canceled, moved to today. It ended up getting delayed, but she's hopeful that she'll eventually get to her final destination. Uh, and while folks here are optimistic, Others around the country might not be as lucky. All day, there's been a ground stop in Seattle and Portland, so travelers hoping to make it there are going to have to really cross their fingers. Buffalo, we saw scenes from that just a bit earlier. That airport is closed, so it's really about where you're going. So travelers should just be prepared. Make sure that they're checking their flight status, and as soon as you get that notification your flight is canceled, the best advice is to talk to an agent as soon as possible. Even be on the phone with your airline carrier as you're waiting in line to make sure you can get rebooked on a flight because Christmas Eve travel and Christmas Day are pretty booked too. So having to shuffle around passengers impacted by this major storm could get a little dicey as we get closer to Christmas Day. Yasmin? All right, Jules Forrest, thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, Want to get to Bill Karen's now standing by for us to bring us kind of the wrap up of this whole thing. I mean, bomb cyclone is what these folks are dealing with really across the country from Shack. Right, all the way um, to the east as well. Those images, Bill, that we've been seeing coming out of Buffalo, those are just astounding. I mean, 0% visibility. When do you hear 0% visibility? <laughs> the answer is now. Right. It's hardly ever. I mean, this is in the blizzard. Typically, you know, if you get like quarter mile or less, it's considered blizzard conditions. And then it goes down to like an eighth of a mile. After an eighth of a mile, it just goes to zero visibility. And they've been that in Buffalo for like three straight hours. I mean, that's nuts. I mean, you can't see a thing. You can't see barely see across the street from your own house. So that's because we've had 60 mile per hour winds and heavy snow. So your snow's falling, plus the snow's being picked up on the ground. And it's just like shaking a snow globe up. And that's what we're dealing with in western New York. Everybody else is still 40 to 50 mile per hour gusts up in Maine. Bangor just had a gust of 62 miles per hour. So there still are people losing power. At the same time, some people are starting to get their power back on. Our bomb cyclone is now located in southern portions here of Canada, just across the lake here uh, from Buffalo and Syracuse. So we're going to get lake effect snow out of this, but we're seeing the end of the rain coming through areas of Boston. The cold front's going through. We've already seen those temperatures plummet in New York and Connecticut, just like everywhere else on the eastern seaboard. And the worst of the wind chills are right now confined to Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh. And areas to the south have begun to moderate a little bit. And Dallas is now at 12. Yesterday at this time, they were at zero. So it's still cold, but it's a little bit better than it was. And the wind is not quite as gusty. So we're at the peak of our storm. And from here on out throughout the rest of the weekend, it will slowly lose its grip. So how cold will it be tomorrow morning when you wake? So Minneapolis is still negative four. Kansas City five. So still Arctic air throughout the northern half of the country. New York City will be 11. The coldest morning you're going to have all weekend and coldest wind chills will be tonight and tomorrow morning on the eastern seaboard. Notice Orlando getting down to 30. And even by Miami standards, 46 degrees, people will be complaining about how cold it is. By the time we get to Sunday, still pretty chilly in Florida. Temperature still in the 30s and 40s for Christmas morning. It'll feel like winter. And throughout the south, more, you know, I don't want to say normal, but it's not the extreme cold that we've been dealing with. So here's kind of how your Christmas weekend forecast has played out. We haven't talked much about the Pacific Northwest, but they had a really bad ice storm in areas uh, right around Seattle especially. 
They've been dealing with very cold conditions too. That gets a little bit better tomorrow as warmer air comes in, but still rainy for Christmas Eve. There's that lake effect snow continuing, the Buffalo area, Cleveland possibly off Lake Michigan, but the southern half of the country is no problems. And then by Sunday, Christmas Day, still cold, but we're not really watching too many travel issues yet. And so we just have to get through tonight and tomorrow. Listen, folks wanted a white Christmas. This is not <laughs> what they wanted. No. Um, let's hope everybody stays safe yeah, um, and gets to where they're trying to go um, during this holiday season. Bill Karen, as always, my friend. Great to see you. Thank you so much. All right, let's take a look, everybody, on Wall Street shifting gears here a little bit. The second to last week of trading for the year. The markets are ending the week on an okay note, a so-so note, right? You see a bid agreeing for the Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ on Friday, all hovering around the status quo. But for the week, only the Dow is up. The other two are way down, in part because of struggles, of course, at, of all companies, Tesla. And after this new report from the Commerce Department showing just a slight uptick, a slight increase in household spending last month, literally as slight as you can go, just a tenth of a percent. That is up five and a half percent from last November. Brian Chung is going to break this all down for us, joining us now. Brian, good to talk to you about this. As always, that spending number, right, what the Fed pr prefers to use for inflation, what does it tell you as we head into this new year, where things are headed? Yeah, yeah, it's been, well, what that number tells us that Americans are still spending, albeit at a slower pace than they've been doing this year. That's essentially a proxy for how you measure inflation. The Federal Reserve, which has been raising interest rates because of high inflation, looks at that measure very closely. And as you mentioned, on a year-over-year -year basis, it shows prices across the board rising by 5.5 percent between November last year and November this year. And that's a slower pace than the 6.1 percent we had gotten from this same measure in October. So it's encouraging to see those numbers going down, but the Fed really wants to see that number closer to 2 percent. That's a reason why they're likely going to have to continue raising interest rates, because that battle with inflation is far from over, Yasmin. The trillion-dollar question, Brian Chung, hopefully you have the answer, because a lot of other um, economists, a lot of folks that are studying this thing over and over again um, and get paid lots of money to do so, do not. Are we or are we not headed towards a recession? Well, Yasmin, if I had that crystal ball and I had the answer, I might be working at an investment bank instead. So instead, what I'll say is I'm not so sure what it looks like. But look, a lot of people think that a recession is defined as two back-to-back -back quarters of economic contraction in this, in this country. And what we saw was a measure yesterday in the morning telling us that in the third quarter of this year, the American economy grew by an annualized rate of 3.2 percent. That's actually more than they had originally estimated just a few weeks prior to that. So the economy is growing. And also, when you take a look at the labor market side of things, people, for the most part, appear to have jobs. It's 3.7 percent. That's the unemployment rate right now. That is the lowest, or it's pretty close to the lowest in the last 50 years. So people have jobs, but inflation is still crunching a lot of Americans. Wage growth has not kept up with that. That's a reason why people are concerned about whether or not those recessionary dynamics might be showing themselves a a little bit more in next year. Can we talk quickly about how Tesla is affecting things, right? Because you see, obviously, Elon Musk, he's trying to run Twitter instead of Tesla. Tesla's shares have been going up and down. They've been all over the place. Then Elon Musk essentially says, OK, I'm going to step aside um, as CEO of Twitter. A lot of folks wondering if that was because of what was happening with um, Tesla stock. Yeah, well, if you're what is Tesla doing to the market right now? Yeah, if you're wondering kind of what the investors in Tesla think about this whole spat over at Twitter, well, you could see it in the shares. Shares of Tesla are down just this week, 18 percent. And since the beginning of the year, 65 percent. But I want to emphasize that it's not necessarily the big weight dragging down the entire S&P 500, for example. Its weight is only about one to two percent. But there are still fundamental issues with Tesla that don't have anything to do with Twitter, for example, waning demand. We actually just saw news this week that the company is going to discount by $7,500 uh, Model 3 and also Model Y. Now, that speaks to an issue that Elon Musk would otherwise address if he wasn't so tied up with what's happening over at Twitter. For what it's worth, Dan Ives, who's an yeah. analyst of Tesla, noted that he, said he thinks Musk is asleep at the wheel. So very much a big issue for people watching wow. that stock. Wow. Wow. Brian Chung, as always, thank you. All right, everybody, let's head over to Washington. Um, a lot going on today. It came down to the wire, but the House just passed, literally just passed in the last couple of minutes, a $1.7 trillion spending bill, narrowly avoiding this government shutdown that was impending. Objections by Kevin McCarthy, most Republicans, were eventually overcome by the Democratic majority. Nine Republicans did end up joining Democrats in passing the package. It now goes to the president's desk. Among other things, the bill funds 
Uh, the government, through September, sends billions in aid to Ukraine and overhauls election law as well. NBC congressional correspondent Julie Sirkin is live for us um, in Washington, D.C. Kevin McCarthy, Julie, and the Republican caucus, they were ultimately defeated today. In January, though, they're going to hold the gavel. They're back in power. How did today's vote set the stage for what's going to happen come the new year? Eliasson, when you look at those uh, nine Republicans that voted for this bill, only seven of them uh, are not going to return to Congress next year. So just two of them uh, Kevin McCarthy, went against Kevin McCarthy, essentially, in voting for this bill. So important context as you analyze those votes. Uh, it, par it passed largely along party lines. Kevin McCarthy was actually uh, in the Senate Republican lunch this week. I talked to him after, and he was there to get on the same message about their spending agenda between the Senate and House Republicans. Next Congress, he said it's going to be a much stronger longer agenda if they stand together. And he's certainly trying to do that as he's fighting for that speakership gavel. And it's part of the reasons why he went against this omnibus bill uh, in the first place, $1.7 trillion in spending. Uh, former President Trump uh, urging Republicans to vote against that bill. But they did defeat. Uh, they were ultimately defeated. This bill passed, not surprising, because Democrats do have the upper hand in this Congress. But it'll be interesting to see what happens in next Congress, as I was talking to uh, some Republicans, even on the Re House Appropriations Committee, uh, who were uh, told not to participate in this process. So some frustrations uh, in his party that he's going to have to deal with. But this omnibus bill and a spending bill, not one of them, as this funds the government through September 30th. Yeah, a major legislative moment, certainly, for um, the Democrats in the final days um, of this year ahead of the, the Christmas holiday. Julie Sirkin for us. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. All right, new details tonight, everybody, from the January 6th Committee's 845-page final report, which largely lays the blame for the attack on former President Trump. The report claims Trump and his inner circle made at least 200 attempts to pressure state officials and legislators to overturn the election results. It also details how the Secret Service was warned of potential violence on January 6th before the rally, but stopped short of major criticism of the intelligence community. And among the recommendations that Congress looked to ban Mr. Trump from holding future federal office, uh, the former president slammed the committee as highly partisan on True Social, continuing to claim the election was stolen, which it was not, by the way, blamed Twitter in part for his loss and attack the FBI as well. Joining me now is Ryan Nobles to talk more about this. Ryan, good to talk to you. So the report essentially kind of was a rehashing of much of what we learned right throughout the summer, throughout the hearings this summer. Walk us through some of the major surprises, the standout moments that we saw in this kind of 845 page or so report. Well, uh, the big revelation from this report uh, was their recommendations, and they did offer up 11 different recommendations that they think are necessary to prevent something like January 6th from ever happening again. And, and among them, one of them's already been adopted. That was the Electoral Count Act. That was part of the omnibus bill that you had Julie talking about. Uh, so that has been uh, already ushered into law or will be when the, the president signs that bill. But they also talked about reforms to the Insurrection Act. And one of the things that they think is necessary is that they need to essentially codify aspects of it around the 14th Amendment that would prevent the former President Donald Trump from ever holding office again. And it, it was clear when you read through these, the 800 pages of this report that they truly believe that Donald Trump is principally to blame for what happened on January 6th. Mm. And as a result, he should never hold office again, not just because of what he did during that period of time, but because it could be ten potentially dangerous if he were to gain office again and try something like this again in the future. Let's also talk about um, the intel agencies, right, and their culpability amidst um, all of this drop in the ball, essentially, when it comes to coordination. The report gives us new information on just how much intelligence was out there pointing to possible violence on January 6th. People knew, right? They saw yeah. what was coming, but they go on to say there was a lack of coordination between DHS, the military, Capitol Police, and the government as well. Walk us through that. Yeah, you know, listen, there's a whole, uh, there's actually two appendices in the, in the end of the report that are dedicated to the lack of uh, the correct interpretation of the intelligence and then and then acting on that intelligence and then also the way the National Guard responded uh, on that day. And, and there's no doubt the committee acknowledges that this was a problem and that this needs to be fixed in the future. But what it also does is say that it doesn't really matter how 
how great the security protocols were on that day because of the conduct of Donald Trump that this was going to be mm. a problem no matter what. This is what uh, the Benny Thompson writes in his foreword. The president of the United States inciting a mob to march on the Capitol and impede the work of Congress is not a scenario our intelligence and law enforcement communities envisioned for this country. So in other words, the argument would be, uh, it'd be one thing if it were just rogue actors uh, that weren't being compelled on by the most powerful person in the world, that might be something that you can protect the Capitol from. That might be something that you can put security protocols in place. But when you have the commander in chief as kind of essentially the person driving all of this, uh, it's almost an impossible scenario uh, to prevent from happening. And that is why there needs to be uh, new reforms put in place to prevent something like this from happening again. Ryan Nobles, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, um, let's talk about this triple-demic or quad-demic at this point, it seems. You got these new CDC numbers out today that COVID is starting to surge yet again. Cases, deaths are both rising, not dramatically, but they're still rising. And that is not all. This year, COVID has company flu, RSV, both respiratory viruses have been surging like never before. A combination that some are calling this triple-demic, as I mentioned. The new numbers today also show flu cases actually down slightly but there have still been 18 million flu cases this season. And it's still early on, by the way, and 17 pediatric deaths reported just this week. So is it time to go back and grab those masks as millions of Americans are traveling and gathering indoors, but no state is mandating masks? Want to bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Uche Blackstock, uh, to break it all down. Dr. Blackstock, as always, it's great to talk to you um, about this stuff. So there's been an increase, right? It's modest, but nonetheless, there's been an increase in COVID cases, a slight decline in flu positivity rate and hospitalizations. But again, as I mentioned, we are early on um, in this flu season. If you were talking to doctors in a normal year, I feel like they would suggest you get your flu shot later on, maybe right early November, right. late October, so you can kind of have the protection all the way through the flu season up until um, the spring. But that thing started a lot earlier um, as we're looking at this holiday season, everyone's gathering and then going back to their homes. Are we just going to continue to see this increase? Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. You know, we knew this was going to be a bad flu season because the Southern Hemisphere had their winter during our summer and their flu cases and their rates and hospitalizations uh, were quite high. And then we've lifted COVID public health measures. And so what we're seeing is this confluence of RSV, flu, and COVID. And to be, you know, to be honest, with flu, flu activity sometimes is very unpredictable. You know, we see we saw a slight decline over the last week or two, but, you know, we have families getting together, loved ones getting together, and we could see those cases going back up after the holidays. It remains too early to, be, to, to know well enough, but people should know that the flu vaccine that is out there this winter is pretty prote it's protective and it, it matches the serotype of flu virus that are circulating right now. So you should definitely still get vaccinated. And as for COVID, we know by now, we've been through this Many times before, unfortunately, we know that <laughs> dry, cold weather, the cases are going to surge. So we are, and we know what to do to prevent those cases from surging. So we have seen some school districts, like say a county in New Jersey, they have actually reinstated mass policies during this, you know, high high transmission time, and that is not unreasonable. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I tell you. Both my kids were vaccinated for the flu, um, as I was and my husband was as well. They both got the flu, but they only had a fever for less than a day. And their pediatrician said to me, it's because they're vaccinated. Had they not been vaccinated, they would have gotten exactly. a much more severe case um, of the flu. Um, Dr. Blackstock, let's talk about the mask um, situation as well, as you just brought up. Looking at poll numbers, um, Axios Ipsos poll from early December showed that 69% of Americans are occasionally or never wearing a mask when leaving the house. 30% said they wear a mask at all times or sometimes. What are your thoughts on this? As you just talked about, some places are now saying um, you should probably wear a mask because of what's happening. Um, should areas, schools, states be mandating masks once again? So yes, I mean, you know, I will say this, that there, there was another poll that came out that actually shows that people, they still support mask policies. They just need to be educated about what the current situation is. So if you say there are high transmission levels going on right now, our cases are going up, we're going to need to put masks back on for 
you know, the next few weeks just to get through this tough spot, most people will do it. So, so even though, you know, 60 something percent of people are not wearing their masks, I think that if we are going to be very clear with our public health messaging, especially at this time, and we know that masks are not only, they're modestly helpful for COVID, but they're incre incredibly helpful for RSV and flu. So I can't really think of a better time for us to actually be masking in indoor crowded spaces than, than right now. And I think mm -hmm. we probably will see more areas, maybe even go beyond recommendations, but reinstitute some of those policies because they are needed. We're seeing hospitals at capacity and our healthcare workforce cannot bear that burden. Got it. Dr. Uche Blastock, uh, if you can stay healthy this holiday season. Thank you so much. You All right, coming up, everybody, uh, that bomb cyclone we've been telling you about, it's going to make last minute shopping and package delivery a little dicey. We're going to have some tips for you, um, the procrastinators. That's who I'm talking to. And it could be an early holiday gift for one lucky winner. Tonight's Mega Millions jackpot is worth more than half a billion dollars. More on that in the five things. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. The FDA says the emergency contraceptive known as Plan B should not be described as an abortion bill. Uh, more on that story in our five things coming up. All right, the jury is deliberating right now in the case of rappers Tory Lanez and Megan The Stallion. Here's what they are talking about. Whether Lanez shot Megan The Stallion, his real name is Megan P. She says Lanez, whose real name is Daystar Peterson, shot her feet as she walked away from him while ordering her to dance. He denies the allegations. Lanez faces three counts. Discharging a firearm with gross negligence, assault with a semi-automatic firearm, carrying a loaded, unregistered firearm in a vehicle that could mean more than two decades in prison if Lanez is convicted. Joining us now is NBC News Now correspondent Nayala Charles in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us on this. We appreciate it. Fans of both these rappers, right, they've been outside the courthouse. What has the atmosphere been like? Well, Yasmin, we've seen some supporters of Megan the Stallion out there with We Stand with a Megan banners. And then we've also seen Tory Lanez fans out there screaming at Megan the Stallion, calling her a liar. The fans for Megan the Stallion say they're there to support her in her time of need. But what they say has been an intense amount of backlash in the court of public opinion since the shooting happened in 2020. Yasmin? C can you tell us about what Megan the Stallion said on the stand from what you know? Yeah. Meg, on the stand, Megan the Stallion says she was in an SUV with Tory Lanez, her former best friend, Kelsey Harris, after leaving a party at Kylie Jenner's home in the Hollywood Hills. She says while they're inside, they got into an argument. She insulted Tory Lanez's music, got out of the SUV. As she was walking away, she says he yelled at her to dance and shot at her several times in both of her feet. We Jeez. know that bullet fragments were taken out of her feet. She went through a process in which she obviously had to get better physically, but she also talked about how it was difficult for her even mentally and emotionally. She says that looking back on the incident now, she wishes that she was killed because she says this entire process has been torture. She's seemingly referring to the backlash she's been receiving on social media as a result of a lot of bloggers putting out false information about the case, which has resulted in a lot of people discrediting her story and not believing her. Yasmin? What's been, what's been Tory Lane's defense? Tory Lane's defense, although he did not take the stand, his attorneys say it's Kelsey Harris, Megan the Stallion's former friend, who shot her at that day. He says that during the incident, her and Megan the Stallion were arguing, fighting over Tory Lane's, saying that was a result of both of them being involved with him sexually in the past. So his attorney is saying that it was not him who shot Megan the Stallion. He told, I actually spoke to his attorney last night, and his attorney says Tory Lanez is confident he will be acquitted on all charges. Of course, right now we're still waiting for the jury to come back with a final verdict. Yasmin? Yeah, a lot happening here. We're going to have to wait and see how this all plays out. Nyla Charles for us. Thank you. All right, let's get you over to the five things um, our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, at least three people were killed and several others injured after a gunman opened fire on a busy street in central Paris. Authorities are launching an investigation into the shooting and are working to determine the suspect's motive. The mayor of Paris's 10th 
arrondissement said the suspect has been taken into custody. Number two, the FDA is significantly changing packaging information on the widely used contraceptive known as the morning after pill or Plan B. The FDA says the package information will make clear that Plan B is not an abortion pill. Up until this new ruling, Plan B, along with generic versions of the morning after pill, said the pill prevented a fertilized egg from implanting in the womb. The FDA says there is no scientific evidence to that. Abortion opponents and politicians who view a fertilized egg as a person use that wording to say that taking a morning after pill is the same thing as having an abortion. All right, number three, a new study published Thursday in the journal Science found a hidden magma network that feeds into different volcanoes in the state of Hawaii. One of those volcanoes is Mauna Loa, which just erupted about a month ago for the first time in 38 years. This discovery will give scientists a clue into how magma travels from deep in the ground to the Hawaiian surface. It also gives them a new look into the behavior of some of the most hazardous volcanoes on Earth. Number four, new home sales were up in November by 5.8% compared to October, but they were down 15.3% from a year ago, according to a joint report from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the U.S. Census Bureau. It is the second month in a row of sales increases. All of this coming as prices remain high and buyers face some of the highest mortgage rates of the year. And then number five, the ultimate Christmas gift this year might be the winning ticket to the Mega Millions jackpot, now worth more than half a billion dollars. No one has won the Mega Millions jackpot since the beginning of October, so the top prize has been growing since then. The drawing will be held tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern. Talk about an early Christmas miracle. All right, everybody. So it's the holidays. That means joy is in the air, and unfortunately, so is a bomb cyclone. Right now, many last-minute shoppers are not just racing against time. They are getting the last of their holiday supplies during a massive winter storm. It is delaying deliveries, and it is not making traffic any better. But that does not mean stores uh, want shoppers to stay home. Some have deals for the procrastinators out there. Uh, luckily, we have NBC News correspondent Emily Ikeda here with some tips for the rush before the holiday. Emily, as always, it's great to talk to you. It is crunch time for all those procrastinators having to get out there and buy these final gifts. What should they keep in mind on Christmas Eve Eve? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a good number of them. More than half of holiday shoppers are still shopping this week before Christmas. You can see the bitter cold is not keeping anyone home. The flurry of uh, shoppers taking advantage and scooping up those deals. And there are a lot of deals to be had. Retailers are slashing prices at a significant rate because they want to clear out that excess inventory before the new year. We've been talking about it for months. They don't want to have all this stuff on their hands with the concerns and fears of a recession potentially looming. And so some of the items that you'll find some of the biggest markdowns on, think toys and games, holiday gift sets, Retailers of course, are really eager. Uh, smaller um, consumer electronics. So take a listen here. We've got a retail expert to help us navigate the final countdown to Christmas. Retailers are really eager um, to get certain things off the shelves, especially those giftable items, those holiday gift sets. So if you can concentrate on those things that retailers want to offload, you actually have the potential to save really big. And Yasmin, you know what makes for a really easy last minute gift? Think digital gifts. So of course, electronic gift cards are classic, but also subscriptions yeah. for books, exercise classes, video games. And if you are doing shopping in person, lean on curbside pickups so you can avoid some of those lines and the final dash for deals, Yasmin. Well, you gotta, you gotta be careful about the exercise classes because then you could be implying something. You certainly don't wanna, don't wanna be implying anything to anybody if you're gifting them with exercise classes. So just know to your audience. You know, I'm, I'm just telling um, you know, some folks out there to know your audience before you're giving up some exercise classes. Wise um, advice. We've been following this winter wallop, right? This, this winter weather um, across the country. And folks are watching this and they're saying, oh my gosh, it's awful, it's horrible. Folks are gonna be without power. Oh, and by the way, are my packages gonna get here? Um, is there a workaround for that? Yeah, it's an excellent question.
It's an excellent question. It's on everyone's minds right now. You know, actually, in the past couple of days and weeks, we've seen pretty fantastic on time delivery performance. Unfortunately, that's going to come to a screeching halt for the next couple of days in certain regions of the country because the severe weather, to the degree that it's so severe, there's only so much that shipping carriers can do. Industry analyst Ship Matrix estimates up to 15% of packages to experience delays in the next couple of days. So that's the equivalent of millions of packages is just in time for the Christmas holiday. USPS closed offices in parts of five states on Thursday because of weather. FedEx and uh -oh. UPS are also experiencing significant disruptions at some of their major hubs, a handful of major hubs. So you should brace yourself for those potential delays. Maybe go back and consider uh, the e-gift cards or subscriptions uh, in these final <laughs> hours in the countdown to Christmas, Yasmin. Or, or just give the gift on the 26th or maybe the 27th. I mean, it's more fun that way right that means it's not over until there all will be of more the gifts deals then. Um, show up exactly NBC's Emily Akeda for us thanks so much appreciate you all right coming up everybody five month old twins in Ohio have been reunited with their mother and each other after they were kidnapped earlier this week and it is a few minutes after midnight in Ukraine Christmas Eve we're gonna have a live report from Kiev where President Zelensky has just returned from his visit to the United States and Poland stay with us All right, welcome back, everybody. A scuba diving Santa Claus is in the Florida Keys raising money for a kid's charity. That is coming up in the local. Uh, but first, um, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is back home. He posted a video from Kyiv after returning from a whirlwind trip, including a meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington, D.C. He also made a historic address to the United States Congress. Uh, Zelensky said the trip heated good results and that, quote, we are working towards victory. Before returning to Ukraine, Zelensky landed in Poland. He met with Polish President Duda. Uh, the exact location of the meeting was kept secret for security reasons. The Polish leader reaffirmed his country's support for Ukraine's efforts to defend itself against Russia. NBC foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is live for us in the capital city of Kiev. This was, Matt, as you all know, this historic trip uh, for the Ukrainian president, right? Not only for more aid, which he will be getting now because of the signing of this omnibus bill, but also for morale within his own country as well as we approach the one-year mark into this conflict with Russia. Describe the mood there right now, if you will, following Zelensky's trip. Well, I mean, look, Yasmin, it's Christmas here, you know, and people are getting ready to celebrate. And it's just like Zelensky said to Congress, Ukrainians are going to be celebrating Christmas in darkness. And that's kind of what you can see behind me. Most of this city is cloaked in darkness and has been for the past several months. That's because of Russia's relentless assault on electricity infrastructure here. Um, but the fact is, is that most people here are determined to celebrate Christmas as an act of defiance. And I went today to a Christmas market here in Kyiv and spoke to some people, not just about Christmas, but also about President Zelensky's visit to Washington and all the gifts that he got from his Christmas list. Here's what they told me. Your country is at war. Are you still feeling the Christmas spirit? Uh, yes, because uh, Christmas is only uh, like uh, one day per year and uh, uh, we must uh, like enjoy this Christmas. President Zelensky told our Congress two days ago, he said that Ukrainians are going to have to celebrate Christmas by candlelight. Is that yes. true for you? Yes, we will do it. Even without candlelights, yeah. we will do it just because we have fire in our souls. We have fire in our souls and we want to overcome all this stuff. Despite the season, do you feel sad? Do you feel depressed? Or do you still feel like, you know? No, we Ukrainians don't feel depressed. <laughs> now we feel uh, like uh, Christmas is coming to town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. So as you can see, Yasmin, folks here, they're not necessarily yeah. going to be dimmed by the dimming lights. They are determined no. to celebrate Russia Be Damned. A, a play on the Christmas song, Christmas is Coming to Town, as she put it. And, and that man has got to be happy this Christmas season with the cutest baby in the world, i got to say. Matt Bradley, thank you so much for bringing us um, the face of that baby. That puts a smile to everybody's face. All right, coming up, everybody, the holiday season usually means big Hollywood blockbusters, but do studios still see Christmas as prime time 
for new releases. We're going to have a breakdown of what's coming to the big screen this weekend. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. NBC covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment that we call uh, the local. From our Midwest Bureau, a missing five-month-old baby from Ohio has been found alive after he and his twin brother were kidnapped earlier this week inside their mother's running car. One of the twins was found in a car seat in the parking lot of Dayton Airport on Tuesday, but police were still searching for the second. The suspect has been charged with two felony counts of kidnapping and will likely face federal charges for crossing state lines. And also from our Midwest Bureau, new body camera footage from police in Kansas shows officers running into a burning home looking for people. Fortunately, they did not find anyone inside the house, but one of those officers is now recovering from smoke inhalation. And from our Southeast Bureau, St. Nick is trading in his reindeer for a scuba suit this year. An instructor at a Florida scuba shop jumped in the water, Santa suit, camera, and all for an underwater holiday photo op. The shoot raises awareness for a local children's charity. They also hold a charity uh, holiday charity dive on Christmas Day. Sports fans already know they have a great gift this weekend. Big games on TV pretty much all day, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We're going to have a preview when we come back. It is a dream Christmas weekend for sports fans, a day that's typically dominated by the NBA. Five games on the holiday slate, all on national television, highlighted by the defending, defending champion Golden State Warriors in primetime. But it's also that one week every seven years or so when the NFL lines up perfectly with the holidays and the league spreading it out, 11 games on Christmas Eve, three on the day, and it hits right as the league's making big changes to how you watch football. YouTube's going to pay $2 billion every year for the next seven years for the NFL Sunday ticket package that lets you watch all the NFL games for a fee. The league's leaving DirecTV, which had held the package since 1994. Jimmy Trana hosts the Sports Illustrated Media Podcast and joins me now. Jimmy, good to talk to you. Um, thanks for joining us on this. It seems like you've got the league here firmly to sign streaming's, streaming's future, especially after shifting Thursday night football um, to Amazon as well. Is it also a sign that satellite's going to have big trouble going forward? You know, I don't, I don't know if it's, this specifically speaks to satellite as a whole. DirecTV will be in trouble here. There are so many people who subscribe to DirecTV specifically for the NFL Sunday ticket package. And a lot of those people are going to be leaving DirecTV next year when the Sunday ticket leaves that satellite service. So for, specifically for DirecTV, this is a huge, huge hit for them. Um, it's interesting because part of the league's appeal to a lot of people is that most games are actually on, you know, CBS, Fox, and of course, NBC as well. Those contracts are locked up, locked up I believe, through 2033. But do you see this YouTube move as kind of the beginning of the end? I don't. I, I You know, it, it does seem like they will be more streaming, but I think the NFL will always have a presence on over the air. Part of this streaming deal, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds in it, but for a long time, everyone thought the deal was going to go to Apple. It ended up not going to Apple TV because the NFL wants to protect CBS and NBC and Fox on Sunday afternoons. That's still where the bread and butter is. They still get 100 million viewers for the Super Bowl, which is on network TV. I think you'll see more games go to streaming, but the playoffs, the Super Bowl, I think they'll always be on network TV as long as network TV is around. I also want to talk about kind of sports viewership on Christmas itself, right? Sports uh, used to take off for the holidays and the NBA moved in, beefing up the schedule, I believe, to five games in 2008. Do the numbers bear it out here? Is Christmas now a big day for sports viewership? It is, and it's taken a very interesting twist in the last two years because Christmas Day was a day that the NBA owned. It was the NBA's day. You mentioned it. Yeah. They started doing five games. They would get very, very good ratings for those games. But now the NFL has decided that they're going to have a presence on New Year's Day. So, uh, excuse me, on Christmas Day. So anytime 
New Christmas Day doesn't fall on a Tuesday or Wednesday, you're going to see a slate of NFL games on Christmas Day. It started last year. They had a, a Browns-Packers game on Christmas Day. It did 30 million viewers. So that means now this year we get three games. Oh, one negative for the NFL, the games on Christmas Day this year um, are not great, especially the that middle game at 430. No one needs to watch that game because it's two teams out of the playoffs in the Broncos and Rams. But <laughs> Chris, the NFL now is stealing <laughs> Christmas Day from the NBA is what's happening. I'm sure... I'm sure people are still going to be watching that day. I feel like it's going to be Thanksgiving 2.0 now on, on Christmas Day with a lot of folks sitting around yep. on the couch just watching game after game yep. after game. Absolutely. And then just subbing in snack time in between all the games. Jimmy Trina, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, that's a wrap for this hour, everybody. Uh, we'll have more for you here Monday, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.